I am going to, oh, here you go. I am Keith Howell, and I am here to uh, get you going on the Man Who Met Tarzan panel. And we've got uh, an esteemed group of uh, speakers here. We got Christopher Paul Carey, we got Paul Spatieri, and we got Wynn Scott Eckert. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Uh, starting with Chris, we'll go to Paul and then to Wynn. Chris, go. Okay. Um, I am Christopher Paul Carey. I am the author of uh, The Song of Kwasin, uh, co-written with Philip Isay Farmer, which was the third uh, ancient Opar uh, book. And uh, I've written several other Kokarsa related Opar related books uh, associated with Phil's Ancient Opar series. Uh, and I'm currently the director of publishing at Ed Grace Burroughs Incorporated. Um, so I got a lot of Tarzan experience in there. Paul, <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you yeah, tell us a bit, little bit about you? Hi, Keith. Uh, Paul Spiteri, part of uh, me. Media House, mostly doing editing duties, written a few short stories in my time, um, but mostly been editing, um, Pharmaphile, and now with Media House. Um, and I guess The Man Who Met Tars and the book that we're going to be talking about is, you know, something that I've been working closely on for about the last year. Well, it feels like a long time, but yeah, something very close to my heart. So looking forward to talk about that, Keith. All right, when? I'm Wynn Eckert. Uh, I write under uh, my full name, Wynn Scott Eckert. Um, my background is both in uh, Farmer and in, and in Burroughs. Uh, uh, I'm the co-author of The Evil in Pemberley House with Philip Jose Farmer, uh, as well as the forthcoming any month now, uh, The Monster on Hold, also with Philip Jose Farmer. Uh, uh, so I've been very lucky to work uh, and complete a couple of his unfinished manuscripts. I've also uh, was um, very fortunate to write the introduction to the new edition. That's not new now, but the latest or most recent edition of Tarzan Alive uh, by Philip Jose Farmer, which came out in uh, Bison Books edition in 2006. And... Um, I don't even know which one is the highlight of all of those things, but <laughs> that, you know, I also have been like just amazingly blessed to be able to write an authorized Tarzan novel uh, for Edgar Rice uh, Burroughs Inc. with you know, amazing feedback and collaboration from uh, director of publishing Christopher Paul Carey, who's like right below me on the screen. So. <laughs> and what was the title of that one? I'm sorry, Tarzan, the battle for Pellucidar, and it came out in October of 2020. There you go. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, my function in or my connection here is uh, I've done a lot of work with Meteor House in terms of graphic design, cover design, stuff like that, and as an artist, and I've contributed some illustrations and book cover design for this book, The Man Who Met Tarzan. So uh, we're all in, connected to this in, in a lot of ways. Philip Jose Farmer is, uh, you know, connections to Tarzan run deep. Uh, we, we know about Tarzan alive, but also he wrote The Dark Heart of Time, which was an, uh, an authorized Tarzan novel. Uh, we also know that he has uh, done pastiches of Tarzan through, uh, occasionally. We, uh, the Lord Grunneth in the uh, uh, the Secrets of the Nine series, uh, Lord Tiger, uh, and even Time's Last Gift has got a little bit of Tarzan in there, if I uh, remember correctly. So uh, you know, there's a there's a good farmer connection here. Yeah. So um, what I want to do is kind of turn it over to Paul to start and talk about the man who met Tarzan and what we're, what we're looking at in terms of what this book is, what's, what's all been pulled together here, and uh, why should people want it? You know, what's, what, what makes this unique? Okay. And I think I'll start with um, a bit of a, you know, how we got here and how the book actually came to be even um, thought of. So last year, I worked on, I don't know if you can see that, A Rough Night for the Queen, which was Phil's biography of Richard Francis Burton. And not because I got props, I might as well use them. And that cover design and that artwork was done by an artist called Charles Berlin, um, 
So, you know, I was working with Charles, we were swapping ideas around the artwork we wanted for the book. Um, and as these things go, the kind of the conversation went a little bit beyond the current project. And Charles is a big fan of Mother Was a Lovely Beast, prop number two. Um, and he, he said to me, you know, in passing, you know, how much he loved that book and how much he would love to see a reprint of it um, and how we'd love to do some artwork for it if, you know, if that were to ever happen. And that got my juices flowing a bit and I started thinking about, you know, is that something we could do? Um, spoke to Mike about it, you know, we kind of thought about it a little bit. That would bit be Mike Croteau, right? Mike Croteau. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my partner in crime, or one of my partners in crime. Um, looked into it a bit more and, you know, quickly realised that just trying to get all of those copyrights that, Bill managed to get, and even Phil struggled. One of the pieces in there, the author, um, has just gone missing. Did an Ambrose Bierce just disappeared off the face of the earth? Uh, somebody Chester, I think, William L. Chester. Um, mm. So Phil couldn't even track down all the copyrights. Um, wow. So, you know, regretfully, I had to concede that that was a project that, you know, may have to wait for another day. Um, talking to Mike about that, you know, and saying, you know, regretfully, we're going to have to park that one it was mike who came up with the idea well what about focusing on phil's tarzan writings you know again that was a bit of a spark so yeah that sounds like an idea well phil um, what uh explain like what the distinction between that and mother was a lovely beast is for those who may not have read it so mother was a lovely beast is is probably phil's only true edited book i know he's he's down as editor on some books but this is definitely phil you know it's he wrote all the introductions he picked the pieces you know this has got phil all the way through it um and it focuses on feral humans basically okay. and you know whether they be you know real examples or in fiction and he's picked a number of of elements stories um articles and put them into a volume so he's obviously very interested in the feral man. Um, and I try to pick up on that when, you know, start talking about how the book is structured. So I think that was something that Phil was particularly interested in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, collecting all the pieces that look like they might fit into a book about Phil's Tarzan writings. The next challenge, really, Keith, was to, you know, how are they going to be ordered? How... How are these going to be presented to the reader? Um, so, you know, look chronological, which is a, quite an obvious way of um, sorting or ordering pieces. But that it just didn't work. It was just too mixed up. You know, some of the ideas, you, it just wouldn't flow well enough. I looked at some themes, but every thematic structure, you know, I came up with. The pieces just didn't, you know, you couldn't decide where pieces should go. Mm -hmm. You know, do you have to leave pieces out because it wouldn't fit? Um, so I kind of took a step back and thought, you know, what was Phil trying to do? And I think what Phil was trying to do, he was trying to prove probably firstly to himself and then to the wider world that Tarzan was real or the character we know as Tarzan was based on somebody real. Um, and I think the culmination of Phil's work in that area was the interview he did with Lord Greystoke. You know, what higher pinnacle can you achieve? You know, you, you start off thinking, is this person real? You do all your research, you, you know, and he did tons of research. Mm -hmm. And he came to the conclusion it was real and he tracked him down and he interviewed him and subsequently even published some of his memoirs. So taking that as a culmination, the interview, Phil meeting Tarzan, um, kind of worked back from that and started to look at, you know, how Phil approached this, you know, first of all, how did this start? You know, Phil's reading of the Edgar Rice Burroughs Tarzan books. So if you look at the, um, the table of contents of the book, it starts with ERB and Phil's interpretation of ERB. And then goes on to, well, you know, I guess Phil was thinking, you know, is this real? You know, some of these things don't make sense in the 
Burroughs books. Yeah. How am I going to rationalise it? So he kind of looks at the problems and explains them. So there's a whole section around that. There's a section around the feral man, you know, just understand how a feral man could exist. Um, and bits of that are picked out from Mother Was a Lovely Beast, just to kind of build that, that evidence that, you know, you could have a Tarzan character in, in reality. There could be somebody out there that Tarzan is based on. And I think once Phil had probably come to the conclusion, at least to himself, that Tarzan was a real person or based on a real person, he then started to expand on that, you know, the arms of Tarzan, language for Opar, mm -hmm. just trying to, you know, build a body of evidence that says, you know, I know, I now know Tarzan is based on a real person, but there's much, must be more to him than that. I need to understand more about this, this man. Um, so there's a whole section around that. And that leads into, so I've put the, um, the memoirs first and, you know, I, the interview is basically the main event, and that's the session right. that is the main event. Um, so it, it all leads to that, um, and that's the idea. It's like a thesis, really. You know, he's got this idea. What's the evidence that Phil gathered and then shared to to prove to us that Harzen was based on a a real man? So that's kind of how we, you know, had the book. Uh, came about and how it was structured. Does uh, does Burroughs himself become a character in this book, in this collection of writing? So th there's so Phil wrote an appreciation of ERB. So there is um, which I've kind of used as a preface for for this volume, and also um, Burroughs appears in a family tree. So. Um, Phil traced back Burroughs' ancestors all the way back to Woden, basically. So there is, so Burroughs does appear and, you know, in quite a lot of the pieces, there's, there's reference to Burroughs, absolutely. So when it says the man who met Tarzan, it does not uh, take it from the perspective of Burroughs as the man, but Farmer as the man. But, and I should say, the I owe a debt of gratitude. Well, Mike and I owe a debt of gratitude to to Chris because it was Chris who came up with the with the title. I mean, really? some of the titles that I came up with, and you know, I'll, I'll claim them all because they were they were rubbish. Okay, you what know? were some of what were some of the rubbish? Oh, titles? you don't want to know. Yes, I do want to know. know. I do. Want uh, to know. It was really <laughs> trite stuff like um, farmers' writings on Tarzan. Oh, that's terrible. On Tarzan that's terrible. and farmer on Tarzan, which you know, terrible. But then, you know, we're bouncing around and I think Chris just kind of sent it, off an email. It, well, it was a, what about my name? It was a okay. collaborative, well, Chris, yeah. it was a collaborative effort um, because Mike suggested a title that was very similar to this. And then I was like, that word, I don't know if that's going to work. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so well, we, we considered calling, we considered calling it, or Mike suggested the the man who loved Tarzan. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that could go in a whole different direction. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, then now we're getting into a feast unknown territory exactly. at that point. <laughs> well, Mike's email to me was Chris has come up with the man who met Tarzan, mind blown. So that you know. So yeah, that you know, I think we all knew that was the right title. As soon yeah, as it's then. like you know it when you see it, right? And I yeah. and when I saw the title the first time Mike shared it, I was like, yeah, Chris, that's perfect. It's yeah. I, I can't imagine a more perfect title for this collection yep. of writing, right? So, all right, yeah. uh, uh, yeah, so that's Chris, the title that's the uh, so Chris, um, let's let's think about this. Then uh, we're talking about the man who met Tarzan. You're working for the corporation that is a part of the original man who met Tarzan, right? Um, yes. So um, how, what, what, do you, what do you think about the uh, farmer and his approach on all this stuff? Uh, uh, and his, his, I don't know, his approach to Tarzan, you know, that start, starts not really with Tarzan alive necessarily, but that's probably the most famous. Right? Uh, but, you know, what's the impact of Tarzan on, on farmer and uh, how does that, maybe come out in the writings that are collected in this book? 
um, the impact of Tarzan on farmer. Uh, yeah. pretty, pretty incalculable, I think. Um, uh, Do we even have yeah. a farmer without uh, Tarzan? Uh, it'd be a different farmer, a much different yeah. farmer, you know. And, um, you know, I, uh, when you think about the, the whole conceit of Tarzan alive, Tarzan is a real person and all that. You know, when you think about it, he's actually getting that from Edgar Rice Burroughs because Edgar Rice Burroughs pretended mm -hmm. that he was, uh, I shouldn't say pretended, but claimed. No, you should avoid the word pretended. <laughs> Claim, claimed is good. <laughs> uh, that he was a real person. And right on the very first page, he talks about how he got the story from somebody, you know. So, um, uh, you know, so he, and he, he continued, you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs continued that approach throughout his his works. And so that, that idea that these characters were alive, I, I think that, I, I know when I read it, it affected me. And I really think that that is probably one of the reasons that Phil always sort of took that approach as well and took it to the next level, basically, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so um, I think it had that impact. I mean, there's a sort of metafictional um, uh, approach that Edgar Rice Burroughs used and then Phil just went whole hog with it, you know, so and, and took is it, it off. Kind of, many is directions. it kind of the conceit of uh, based on a true story kind of a thinking, you know, when you when you watch or you read something that's based on a true story, there's there's something different about how you connect to the material. Right. Yeah. And so when Burroughs presents this stuff in such a way that uh, it's always presented as this is a true story that switches your gears a little bit yeah. you're not you're not in the realm of fantasy anymore your brain is reading this in the context of oh wow this happened right yeah. i mean and, that, that little question like what if this happened and that does something i i think that taps into the whole idea of mythology and um this oral storytelling that's been around forever um where you you kind of you want to believe you want some excuse to be able mm -hmm. to believe it and when the writer gives you that excuse you're kind of all in on it so yeah yeah because yeah. the world is so much more fantastic if you can believe that there's a tarzan out there yeah. right i mean that that's a fascinating idea to think you live in the same world that this is happening you might be a part of that and it could be a part of your life yeah. And so the man who met Tarzan is a way of sort of like bridging that gap, right? Between fiction and reality. Am I right? Paul? Yeah, yeah. Reality, I, I think reality. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. When? What, 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 what do you got to say? I, gonna, I, I just said, or reality and reality. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, I think, you, I think you've identified something very important, Keith, and something that speaks to me heavily in in the type of stories that I'm drawn to. Um, you know, he, I mean, Burroughs ins inserts himself not only into the Tarzan books, but into the rest of his books as well. Um, you know, as as a character, you know, as the nephew of John Carter, and he met mm -hmm. Carson Napier before Carson took up on took off on his rocket trip, exactly. his wrong his wrong way tr rocket trip um, to Venus. And, and what strikes me is that the rest of the, all the other literature that I'm drawn to the, does similar things. Sherlock Holmes, it's oh, yeah, yeah. sort of thing. Watson is real, it's all narrated, mm -hmm. and therefore Holmes is real. And you know, just treating these characters as, you know, that there are real world analogs for, for them. And there's, there's this other, all of this stuff is happening like behind the veil, right? And if you right. can just, if you can just pierce the veil or just peel the onion back one layer, you can see all this stuff that right now you can't, you know, you can't quite see. In a sense, you know, I, let, let's take it even out uh, beyond just the world of fiction. Um, but, you know, we're living in a time in which the world of the conspiracy theory is <laughs> prominent, correct? I mean, and this is the concept, the idea that these, that people at large are starting to to need, feel this need to glom onto this idea that there is something larger than themselves that is controlling what's happening around us that there is there is more 
to this world than just me going to a job and working nine to five and earning a paycheck, right? And there's this need that's deeply ingrained in human beings, right? That yeah. need to know that. And so you have the great adventures uh, uh, stories, like especially, I mean, Tarzan is one of the greats, right? What is it? Tarzan, Mickey Mouse, and Superman are like the three most recognizable characters in the world. Uh, you know, um, it's like that need to uh, grasp that or to just to just believe that this is happening is very important to us because it gives it gives us in our meaningless lives a little bit of meaning that there is something happening beyond us that, uh, and that we can maybe be a part of it. And so this is where only, this book is great. It pulls us in, right? That's right. So if only those people read. I'm just going to say that, right? And yeah, went, yeah. And, and went for the went for the these conspiracies, the Wold Newton meteor and the French Revolution, you know, machinations that led to people being at Wold Newton when the meteor fell on the nine, you know, and all. If only people would just, you know, like yeah. just focused on that stuff, right? Instead of you know the National Enquirer. Yeah, it's a it's a healthy stuff. conspiracy theory, correct? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a healthy expression of of that human need right <laughs> right i mean i've said but i've said before that uh, that uh you know people people search for god people search for uh these conspiracies all of this because we've got to believe or we have this need in us to believe that someone is in charge right. someone's in control because okay. otherwise it's all chaos right and so yeah you get the you get this idea that that uh, all this chaos is happening but uh, there's a tarzan out there that gives us hope right it gives us hope to know there's a tarzan out there i mean when i was a kid that was a that was a cool thing to think is tarzan out there yeah. i mean we could use a tarzan these days right and mm -hmm. tarzan is you know is a human he's exactly he's not a superman. you know you know he's not right superman. exactly you know. he's achievable Yes, he's believable. Absolutely, he's a real world superhero, if you like. And I, I, I do think Phil, you know, going through all these pieces, and I must have read these pieces in this book 20 times at least, um, you know, in preparing the book. And you can't read them that many times without starting, wh whether it's, it's right or wrong, starting to think, you know, what was Phil thinking at the time? You know, was he, you know, was this it revelation that said, yeah, I can now actually prove that Tarzan is real? You know, Burroughs, and I, I hear Chris, you know, you're absolutely right. Yeah, Burroughs talks about this as being real. But, you know, when Phil talks about some of the Tarzan stories that couldn't possibly be, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of, breaking that down and trying to say, right, okay, yeah, I understand, you know, Burroughs had a deadline, so some of the stories, yeah, you know, and that's why some of them are a bit fantastical, maybe, you know, and I, I think Phil just builds a, you know, a, a body of evidence that says, yeah, you know, you can ignore this, or you can accept this, or you might want to rationalise it this way, but these are the bits of evidence that mean to me that I got there. There's a, a very good reason, I think, why Phil um, uh, discounted certain parts of the Tarzan canon. And I think that's because he was trying to sell the story. When you say, when you, you, you confuse the mind a little bit because you're, you've already been hooked. Is, tar, is, he, is he serious? Is Tarzan, is this really a biography about the real Tarzan? And then when he says, well, this part isn't real, but this part is real, but this part, no, no. And then it does something psychologically to your mind where you're like, Yes. You you get even reeled further in, basically. That, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Yeah. 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 And I, th I think, you know, I, I've got to feel that Phil felt he really, you know, made a revelation, if you like, just to had really got under the skin of it and knew, you know, and, you know, he met him, he published, you know, and even just thinking, you know, and obviously we can't um, print a documentary in a book but the more tarzan documentary where you know he says i, I know he was real you know yeah. i've met him yeah you know it's you know and just the look on his face you know like cool you know yeah of course you know, I, okay I, well I, 
I do think he was real to Phil. You know what I mean? I think he was real to him because myths were real to him. Stories were real to him. He he was just supercharged with the idea of story and mythology. And uh, since a, since uh, a young age, I mean, I think you have in do you have in here? Yeah, the Golden Age and the Brass. So um, so that 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 essay in the book is a really great essay because it just shows his passion um, uh, and about how how he was growing up and how these these different uh, works that he ran into authors and characters influenced him primarily Edgar Rice Burroughs. But, um, but an interesting thing also is that Tarzan is a trickster. He's a classic <laughs> trickster archetype. I mean, literally a trickster archetype. And Phil himself was the master trickster. So like he probably very much identified with Tarzan, you know, and I think that's an interesting thing. So Tarzan was the sort of the perfect outlet for Phil, who was also this great trickster. You know, it's the, it's the trickster writing about the trickster. <laughs> well, well, correct, yeah. correct me on this. I mean, but uh, it's, more of, it's more of a blend of the trickster hero archetype because doesn't the trickster normally undercut themselves um, in, in the archetype? It's like their machinations usually wind up are undercutting themselves like think daffy duck or somebody like that they usually they have grand plans and they're going to pull these machinations on people but then it's gonna the rug's gonna get pulled out they're gonna they're gonna screw themselves up but 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 by taking the hero archetype and and merging it with the trickster yeah you get tarzan who is who yes he exhibits the classic aspects of the trickster archetype but he also manifests the hero archetype both so he's almost like a unique combination am i right or am i well, it's, the trickster that? archetype isn't necessarily that the trickster does something and it comes back and bites him it's often that he does something crazy and stupid and then <laughs> ends up saving the day you know okay. too and you know i think i don't know i think phil could identify with that <laughs> 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 well, I mean, my memories of uh, of Phil definitely have that that sense of yes, that twinkle in his eye, and yeah, uh, he, and I and yeah. I feel like that when I read his writings about Tarzan, it's like I really feel like he's smiling the whole time. When I'm reading that, I'm getting Phil's smile. You know, his eyes are twinkling, and he's looking at you, and he's going, and you know, he's challenging the reader to to uh, to tell him this isn't real. Well, you know? <laughs> it's, it's so in Tarzan Alive, you know, and uh -huh. Chris, your point is extremely well, that's how he sells it by eliminating, so to speak, some of the stories from reality, like Tarzan and the Ant-Man or Tarzan at the Earth's core, because a hollow Earth can't, cannot exist and it's not real world, right? So he's saying like, look, I like, I get it, right? Like this story is so hard to believe that, <laughs> that that Tarzan was, you know, orphan, and he taught himself to read. He taught himself speech so that he didn't turn into, you know, you know, he didn't whatever that thing is. When like, if you don't learn speech by a certain age, then you can never learn speech. Like he explained that, explained that. But look, I know this is so ridiculous and unbelievable. But look, I mean, I know that the Hollow Earth stuff that really didn't happen, right? So that's how he sells it. You're right. But trickster, right? He says it all didn't happen, and then. He outlet at the end of the book, he outlines a chronology of Tarzan's life, right? Of all of the adventures. And he says, Oh yeah, this one, it didn't happen. But if it did happen, this is when it took place. Yeah. Right? Well, when, uh, it, isn't it Burroughs? And I think it's in Mother Was a Lovely Beast that wrote the piece about uh, uh, Tarzan deciphering the language. Wasn't that the, uh, a, a short story? Am I remembering around that, right? Yeah. The, the yeah. God of Tarzan, I believe, is that right. where I mean, he finds a book and he. Insane. Yeah, and he starts to put together the, the, the little bugs. He, I think he sees yeah. them as like little bugs. I mean, for me, I was a kid when I first read that, and, and like that made total sense to me. It made sense. I mean, my brain was able to go, oh, this could be, this could be real, right? And so Phil takes that and goes with it, right? Yeah. I mean, technically, Tarzan isn't a feral man because he's, right. you know, he is brought up by an intelligent species who do have a language so he hasn't missed out that, that is true and that is something that a lot of people who don't really read the books but only know the movies don't really understand right so why don't you expand upon that about the mangani and what that actually means 
in terms of like he was actually raised by an intelligent species because a lot of people just think gorillas gorillas or apes or apes right it's more than that yeah. was it not talk about that a little bit i, I mean do you want me to talk about that chris or do you yeah. want to talk about that um, yeah one of you, 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 <laughs> you I'll, I'll, I'll start chris is is a much more knowledgeable than i am but yeah but absolutely i mean you know just reiterating what you've just said keith you know uh, mangani were a you know a civilized group of people they they had a language they had a structure you know in the in the book there are descriptions of you know in tarzan's memoirs um you know, he talks about the Mangani and, you know, their culture, their mores, you know, their ethics, um, their, their customs. So they had a, a civilization, if you like, if I can use it in that mm -hmm. word. You know, they, they had a culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Tarzan was brought up, um, OK, in a very different environment to the one he would have been brought up if he'd um, been born in England and, you know, um, took on the, uh, the role he was technically destined to have but um you know you know he had all of you know he had an education not the same education as us and so when he came to read and decide how he was going to read it at least i think he had um a kind of structure in his brain mm -hmm. that allowed him to rationalize that yep these are letters they must have sounds they must have meanings um, it makes it much more believable does it not? I mean, and and it even gives him that greater thought, like where he's looking into the skies and he's thinking um, supernatural. He's thinking gods. He's thinking something above us. That concept that when we think of animals, there's not that concept. So the Mangani experience of raising him at least laid a foundation that allowed him to be able to conceive of yep. something beyond himself. Hmm. And greater and, than himself. Um, in uh, it's interesting because you know Phil, I think uh, he he took that the way that Tarzan was brought up and learned how to read and stuff like that. Uh, that that um, I'm hesitating to see how far to go into the anthropology of it because Claude Levy Strauss, a social hey, anthropologist, go uh, go, friend, go deep. We got time. Wrote, we wrote about time he wrote a book called The Savage Mind. Um, uh, La Ponce Sauvage, um, which uh, talked about the differences between like kind of like scientific, Western scientific thinking and how like uh, a person raised in, you know, so-called primitive societies had a different mode of thinking, you know, and I, know, I do know Phil owned that book. I saw it on his shelf. <laughs> um, and um, when, when Phil wrote The Dark Heart, Heart of Time, Tarzan and the Dark Heart of Time, uh, he actually illustrated that basically because he had uh, Tarzan thinking um, that uh, the word Usha means the wind in Mangani in the Mangani speech. And, uh, and he had Tarzan thinking that the, when, you know, when he was a, a young and <laughs> before he, you know, ran into civilization, that it was the wind, it was the leaves that created the wind rustling, you know, so the leaves rustling were the, the energetic thing that was actually making the wind versus the wind making the leaves rustle, you know? And that's like a, a perfect illustration. I mean, that's like, like Levi Strauss, that could have been an example straight out of a Levi Strauss essay or something, you know? So um, very interesting how he did that. So he thought it through on multiple levels, you know? Hmm. When, what do you got to say on this topic? You've been quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the topic of how Tarzan could have been real or... Yeah, yeah, let's, let's keep on going with that. Uh, or, or, or how that was expressed in Burroughs and Farmer both. Well, you know what one of my favorite Farmer books is, is Lord Tiger. Um, okay, there you go. That's, and, a good, that's a good option. Yeah, and Lord Tiger is, is Phil's sort of extrapolation on well, what could you do to create the conditions to create like a real, a real life Tarzan? So while he had, had already demonstrated that Tarzan exists and could be real or was real, then he took it this other layer, right? Of, well, yeah, but let's really make it real, right? You know, so, uh, so 
this 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 billionaire you know gets this orphaned child and then strands him in the jungle and tries to create this all of the conditions to create a tarzan you know and what you know could it happen and it's all very he's it's one of his most underrated novels and i know yeah it's fantastic Paul, you love yeah. you love that book as well um and I, I think it's probably one of his great books yeah phil, phil loved that is it book. well phil, phil told me that was one of, phil told me that was one of his favorite books that he wrote yeah. Would you consider so, it maybe a fantasy fulfillment on his part, like imagining what he might do if he was a billionaire? Um, you know, no, might I, he might he have that. been willing to do that because he was so into Tarzan that he I might have wanted to try to see the fulfillment to be Ross Tiger, to be yeah. the one like <laughs> to be the one who got experimented upon, and like maybe yeah. I can be this Tarzan, right? Yeah. Or if they can take this this infant and do this experiment and make this infant grow into a Tarzan-like character, then anyone could do it, right? I can do it, you know, yeah. Um, I, I think Phil would have wanted to meet Rad's tiger. That, he, he wouldn't have been Boigle, the billionaire. That, you know, that just wasn't Phil. He would never have done that to another human being, I don't think, for a second. Has um, Meteor House I, entertained the idea of, uh, of a second Lord Tiger story? Um, we've thought of everything over the years. It's probably okay. not one. <laughs> it's just occurred to me that might be an interesting direction to go. Yeah. And and you know the book ends quite open ended. You know, yeah, very much so. like most of like claim. most of Phil's writing. Correct. I mean, yeah. most of his writings end very open ended. Like it's an ending, but it's an ending in which life goes on. Right. But, but specifically for that, you know, he is going yeah. into civilization. He's, I think the final scene is him on a plane thinking about yeah. what's he going to find. So, he, you know, it is the Tarzan going into civilization. And, right. I, and I, I do love that book. And I love that, um, you know, the billionaire is following Burroughs. You know, he's trying. So, you know, Phil is above that. It's like the layers, you know, Phil is above yeah seeing a billionaire trying to recreate Burroughs Tarzan you know it's just yeah and and I think the writing in that book is is mm -hmm. probably amongst his, his best as yeah, well I, I, I agree it. totally yeah Lord Tiger is one of his best and it's underrated in that context yeah I, I mean I I wonder if the book in some ways was um uh I mean of course it was but satire because um yeah <laughs> it is just satire the, yeah, it, yeah i mean it is satire but just yeah. the idea the, the idea that um almost like uh other people trying to create their own because there's been a history of tarzan clones including ones that phil has done <laughs> you know, yeah. none, of them, none, of them have, none of them have met the level of tarzan right none of them really can can make it there in a way him showing this like really bizarre way of like you know dressing people up as apes and you know like raising somebody uh, was was lord tiger did it predate lord of the trees i can't remember um I'm one, year, one year was one year after one year after okay yeah. well that's kind of interesting to think about yeah you know like maybe there were some thoughts that came in in the writing of lord of the trees that he wanted he wound up playing through in lord of lord tiger and then yeah, the saddest part was, and then one or two years after was Tarzan Alive. So there was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then the ancient Opar books followed. It, like he, he had this segment of several years from like what, 19 where he was really just focused to, on Tarzan, yeah, you know? 69 to yeah. 74. Yeah, like man, when, all that. When all does that Time's stuff. Last Gift fall into this? Do you remember? It came out in 72. Yeah, so, it's right in there. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all within that that realm where he was really into tarzan wasn't yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. okay okay just quickly going back to lord tiger because one yeah. of the bits that i think struck me the most about lord tiger was that raz tiger i think was the third or fourth experiment that this, this mm. billionaire had done mm. so and I can, I can remember when i first read that just you know just imagining that this you know He'd gone through this three times and failed three times, and yeah. now he's finally got it. And just, you know, there's a story for those first three attempts. Though, oh, you know, wow, yeah, you're I, right. It, it I never did. thought about. I never thought about that. 
you know, and he kind of explains what happened. You know, they just mm -hmm. didn't, you know, almost the, the seed didn't sprout, if you, you put it that way. You know, sure. they or died on a vine, whatever analogy you want to pick. But, um, you know, it just didn't quite take. And it finally took Perez. And I think there is a, a thought, you know, why did it work there? And, you know, did he now have a repeatable process or could he have now had a repeatable process if he wanted it? So I, I just, um, you know, repeating myself, but yes, I think it's a, it's a great novel and probably the one, I mean, I'm a big fan of Time's Last Gift as well. And I've probably read those two books, Lord Tiger and Time's Last Gift, probably more than any other. Yes. Um, probably more even than Riverworld, which I love as well. And World of Tears, which I love as well. And Unreasoning Mask, which I love as well. And et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to pick a favourite farmer. Yes. Yes. My favourite's constantly shifting. <laughs> you know, I, I used to say it, the one I've just finished is my favourite yeah. farmer. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um. I wouldn't mind talking a little bit, Keith, if there's, you know, if yes. you can indulge me just a bit about the art. Um, okay. A little bit about the cover. Because um, okay. I, I love the art. So, and I, I just, I think people might be interested in the story of, um, of the cover. So okay. Mike and I were looking for something to grace the cover of this book. And we knew right. roughly what we wanted. And um, Chris was involved in some of our search as well and i'm not sure who initially pointed us at the picture we used was it you chris it was. Um, it, <laughs> yeah it wasn't me I thought there as well <laughs> um, but, but so, it, um, it wasn't i i know that it was uh using john Soley's art that had never actually been used for a cover right am i right that's right it was yeah. I, I believe it was it was commissioned as a poster so yeah, ERB right. commissioned it as a poster, but not as um, book art as such. Right. But it's such, and I was looking behind you, Keith, on your um, background to see if you had an image of it. That I, could I don't, but, uh, but you know, it's it's easily accessible. Just uh, look it up on the Meteor House Press. Uh, but it, dot it's com a great website. image. Yeah, yeah, um, it's a fantastic and, image of Tarzan with uh, with some of the Mangani and a big, giant tree behind it, and it's just a gorgeous image. And I don't know why it's never been used as a cover before because when it was presented to me i immediately saw the cover you know yep, yep. and it was like how am i going to uh work that uh image in with the title and and the author um you know working it out and i'm like looking at that i'm again i'm i'm still it's one of those things where i'm amazed it's never been a cover before yeah, well, I, can't, I, you know, I, I can't imagine why it wasn't. I, I mean, I think uh, uh, a licensee approached Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated and said, we want to do a Tarzan poster. And then they commissioned the art and it became a, a, an authorized, you know, product, a mm. uh, Tarzan product. And so I think just no one ever thought of it as more than just a poster. Interestingly, when I was, when I was, uh, uh, I don't know how old I was, 13 maybe, um, mm. I had written to the to Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated, uh, trying to track down certain books of of ERBs that I couldn't find. And, <laughs> of course, uh, you did. <laughs> and I, I got a couple of replies from uh, Danton Burroughs. Um, and in one of the one of the replies, there was like an insert, and it was a uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs newsletter called uh, "The Tarzan Drumbeat." It was put out by the company just to sort of show new stuff going on. And, it was actually a fairly old one. Like, they, I guess they had stopped doing it in the 1970s. And so it was from like 1977 or 78, I can't remember. And it had that John Soley poster in it as one of the new products. And um, it captured my imagination. I remember dreaming about that, that particular scene, you know. Uh, it's that view that, you know, the great ape in the bottom right-hand corner of the cover, just looking straight at you you know, yeah. is just so engaging. Yeah. And, you know, and I can remember, you know, Mike, I think, found his phone number because, you know, we or I wanted something from, I wanted to talk to John Solly about the art and see if he would write something for the book. Um, and Mike, I think, found the phone number. And I, I can remember calling the guy and, you know, he probably hmm. thought, who 
you know, this guy with a weird accent calling me mid-morning, I've just had my breakfast, you know, what's it, very guarded at first, but, you know, I, I guess that first call, we were probably on for about two hours talking, talking about Tarzan, talking about his, you know, his work, because he's done, I mean, I didn't know the name, but um, if you do a Google of, of John Solly and, you know, artwork, you, all these um, movie posters come up, you know, there's oh, yeah. Yeah. a fantastic yeah. amount of stuff out there that you recognise. Um, so, you know, and it was and great. He sent me, you know, he hand wrote a little piece, which um, he sent me in the post um, and I typed it up and it's, it's in the book. There's a couple of paragraphs, um, just his view of it. So that was just great having that. And I've, and I've also got to call out the other um, artwork in the book by none other than our very own Keith Howell. He's done some, <laughs> you know, there are some really great interior um, pieces of art in the book that I think are really going to blow people away. There are some. I really got to play with art. some new some new technique on it, which was fun, you know. Uh, and my approach on that was uh, it was a lot of fun actually. And it, and it works really well. I mean, I can't yeah. wait to see the finished book. You know, Mike is in the enviable position of getting the, you know, the proof. <laughs> so he gets to see the physical book yeah. before anybody else. And, you know, for that reason, I am considering moving to Atlanta, but. <laughs> well, I gave it, I gave him an extra one. He didn't ask for, I don't even know if it's going to be in there. That's actually ERB with uh, Tarzan. So we'll see if that makes it into the book. I don't know. Uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's like this book has been inspirational uh, art, art wise so i i think it's going to be a beautiful book from what i can gather and content wise uh, um from the stuff that i've already read is just fantastic uh, i can't imagine a tarzan fan that wouldn't be interested in this book and i think it is probably yeah. uh, win kind of alluded to it well uh, has alluded to it but um you know there are extra pieces in this book that have never been published before you know particularly around the interview um and you know we, we managed to unearth some of phil's prep work for the interview which is really interesting because you know he, he started to get his thoughts together and he changed it and you know he stuck and you could see where you know even after he went back and put some notes back against his original comments and you mm. know, just get all these pieces together and i think what's really interesting as well is that he experimented with a totally different style for the interview. He went, he, you know, experimented with a purely pro style approach to the interview. He said, he said, rather than Tarzan colon, farmer colon. Mm -hmm. um, so after the art, after the interview, there's um, some extra information, so, you know, an addendum kind of, um, where, you know, you can see how Phil, you know, took a different approach and, Mm -hmm. it's the same content you know you can see the same themes you know slightly expanded but you know he obviously really wanted to get um behind it and he, he must have you know wonder how long he spent just actually going through this prepping you know for the 15-20 right. minutes whatever it was that you know I don't think it was quite only 15 minutes but so there's a couple um, of nuggets in there too right I mean so you said Paul that the notes are sort of like a a different perspective on what ended up in in the interview but yep. there are a couple of themes that actually sort of ended up on the metaphorical cutting room floor too right a few yeah. and yeah. and you know without getting into spoilers or like really releasing everything hopefully it's okay that i say like there's one really intense back and forth between farmer and graystoke about the ethics of immortality Yes. And uh, and the ethics of immort immortality elixirs and sharing or not sharing these immortality elixirs with the world at large. It's and and that's where your brain goes, right? Any right. any person thinks, hey, look, if if this is real, and if Tarzan is real, and an immort immortality elixir is real, then what are the real world implications? So, so the, and, and are you saying that landed on the cutting room floor? It's yeah. not in the book. Oh no 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 no! no. I mean, for, I'm sorry. From the final printed interview. Okay, so it's actually in the book. Yeah, it's in the book. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, good. Good. So we get that that we get that exchange. Uh, yeah. We as readers 
we get that yeah. exchange that talks about that. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So um, ultimately, what are we what are we looking at here? Are we looking at a, a philosophical debate, a practical debate? What are we talking about? Uh, Between well, the two. Well, I mean, you can you can take that. I mean, I think it was both. I think it was a philosophical yeah, I think it was and, and a practical debate. Philosophically, yeah. should it be shared? Practically, what are the real world implications of 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 having that shared? And also Tarzan or Lord Greystoke as a practical human being, right? Like he's the hero, mm -hmm. but then when it comes down to it for all practical purposes, like, well, okay, but no, I'm sorry, just for me and my family. Is that is that selfish? Feel... I don't know. Is it? I mean, incredibly. I mean, yeah. it's, I mean what, it, when when you think about the real practical world implications of that, is it selfish, or is it practical? Exactly. Yeah. I actually had a discussion with Phil about this, um, mm -hmm. and we were at dinner, and the the subject came up uh, of the whole immortality thing, and Phil said that he was actually. 23 years old he looked you know physically 23 years old but he had makeup on and then he, he very deadpan uh, talked about how how serious it would be if you did have you know some kind of immortality elixir and how you'd have to be willing to kill to protect to protect you and your family or, or you know who might be using it so right it was it was it was quite uh an entertaining conversation <laughs> and the, and you know and this would have been him in his later years so he yes. would have been facing his own mortality yeah in that context right, right. i mean he, right. he saw the end on the horizon right. so um this was obviously a thought that was uh forefront in his thinking yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, i think um, oh, i'm sorry go ahead yeah, no, ahead, I was just going to say, because, and just one final thought on that exchange around the immortality, because in that bit that didn't make it into the real, or the, the published interview. The, the final you know, published Yeah, the, I mean, there is a bit of a comment that, that says, you know, Tarzan saying, well, I think you could have it, you know, I think I would trust you, Phil Farmer, yeah. to be responsible in that bit, but, you know, I can't make an exception for you. You know, and to, to me, what that said was there was a building of a bond between these two people. And I think that's what Phil wanted. He wanted a bond with um, with Tarzan or Ras Tiger or whoever. You know, he wanted to know these people and know them well, um, hmm. as well as perhaps be them as well. Yeah. Sorry, when I interrupted you. No, 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 no. You're fine. Oh. I would just, so was, was, was Paul, Wait, no. was, uh, was Phil... Um, wanting okay let's let's take it into this area okay let's assume Greystoke is a a real human being of some uh, what do you mean a yeah okay well, he, he let's is. assume that yeah. let's take that assumption yeah. um yeah. so was phil um wanting to assume a a special position here as the as the go-between in, uh, in this realm between what the world thinks of his fiction, you know, is he, was he, did he see himself in a special role here? No, I, Do, I, does I this book represent that? No, I, I think fundamentally Phil wanted to know um, Tarzan, you know, he, did I, he? I, you know in, in my terms, he wanted to have a pint with him down the pub. And you know, did he? Did he, from your perspective, from your point of view, did uh, did Phil have that relationship? Was was is Tarzan real in some context in uh, through Phil? So it, to me, it's fairly obvious that there was a relationship beyond the interview because you know Lord Greystoke sent some of his memoirs, you know, and he may have sent more. You know, we don't we don't know. And there is part in the book where there is a little bit. You know, but it's so small. Um, and there may be, memoir. and there may still be some documents that haven't quite gotten through in the uh, magic filing cabinet. That Absolutely. might, and that, you know, right? I suspect some of them may even have been destroyed. You know, to protect. Which would whoever. make sense. Which would make sense if Drake Greystoke is real. Yeah, this because we is. know he um, misled us about where the interview actually happened. Mm -hmm. You know, to protect. You know, at Greystoke's. Um, insistence or request mm -hmm. so you know you 
you know, Phil would have protected him. I, I think um, it's not, and I, I don't think Phil wanted to be Tarzan's agent, if you like, and be the person who represents, you know, as Burroughs did. No, I don't think that's what Phil wanted. I think Phil wanted to, you know, tell me what you did last week. Lord mm. Grace, you know, mm. what adventure did you get up to? You know, what what actually happened? I mean, you know, that sounds great. You know, tell so me. You, know, you, don't see, a... you don't see Phil as looking to be uh, Greystoke's friend, but he's wanting to be able to be um, his voice in a way to the world. Well, no, I, I think it's more about um, he, he wanted to be his friend. You know, really? I think, you know, it's, okay. I, who, who wouldn't want to be friends with Tarzan? You know. I I would be intimidated by the concept, by the idea. Oh, yeah, but you know we're talking about Phil. Like <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> the, I mean Phil was a different sort, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right. You're right. I would as well, but you know. But okay, well, Chris, Chris, what what about yeah. in relationship to Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, publishing um, and their perspective on Tarzan? Um, do they? Would you? Would you see? Do you see this as? Um, Tarzan is a real person or a fictional uh, construct of Edgar Rice Burroughs? Of course, Tarzan is a real person. <laughs> okay. You know? Okay. I mean, and how does that Burris, relate to Burroughs, Burroughs and Farmer Bo? Right. So okay. I, I want to talk about, about Fall, that. though, because I want to. I just want to follow up on what what you guys were just talking about there, which is uh, to say. Um, Phil, um, in his afterword to the last Doc Savage omnibus, he talks about how a fictional character can be more real, more real, I believe is the term he used, than, than we are, than, a, than a, you know, and, and, and I think in Phil's mind, uh, a lot of these characters were more real, real to him. <laughs> that's the book uh, how, how does that real work? To him, how does more that real work? to him than people he would meet in ordinary day I mean, life because they're uh because they they do something psychologically to you you know like and i think that um is this is this part, dealing with I, the the jungian concept of the archetypes or or are you I, or is this m deeper than that i think that i mean this might be my own personal view and i'm i'm interposing it on on phil but um like the way i see it we access we access another realm when we're in, engaged in a creative activity whether it, you can be a creative reader as well as a as a writer right and i think a lot of people don't realize that because when you're reading something your brain is doing something different and it's coming up with all these angles even though you're not writing it down on paper you're having all these thoughts about these characters who aren't really in front of you but but they get into your head, you know. Yes. And so I think that when you're reading, um, you enter you enter another world, and it's like I, I always compare it to a shamanic experience. You're like a shaman going to the other side. Yes. You yes. experience something uh, of this uh, of a different order of reality that changes your life, changes everything ab about you, and then you come back to the normal world, and then you're left kind of to deal with what you experienced in this other place and there's this sort like of the, like they, like they the don't, shamanic, they don't really, they don't like really the mesh and like i think the what, shamanic view of the dream world versus the the physical world yeah exactly right right yeah, i yeah. mean that's what I, that's what i'm getting from you it's like it, it, the the old shamanic view of uh when you go to sleep you you exit this reality you go yeah. to another reality you're living another life yeah and then sometimes it overlaps. Yeah. And that's and where and that's where the impact comes. And right? I think why isn't it real. Why isn't it real? I mean, yeah. it's not it what is, is real. It is exactly. It is real. I mean, yeah. if I experience this bizarre dream where all of these things happen, you know, in this dream and and then I wake up, why is that why is that not real? And I'm not expressing it as artfully as you, Chris, but you know, there are different, like you said, pathways to reality. And why should we just dismiss that? Well, dismiss I think it, I think it also ties back to the books. concept of surrealism and the whole dream concept. The idea that, um, um, and I can't remember the French, the French artist who uh, came up with the concept, but the idea that uh, when we go to sleep, uh, that's the point where we're not in control of our thoughts. And if we're not in control of our thoughts, who is? 
But right? isn't that different? To, so, you know, picking up on what Chris said, and I think I probably experienced it. When you, when you read something, you consciously make that world and start to, to position. And, I, and I'm, I'm very much aware that's exactly what I've done going through all of these pieces. I've, you know, I've constructed um, a world um, based on what I've read of what I think Phil thought and wanted. Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know if that's really what Phil thought about um, Tarzan and that's what he wanted. You know, when you dream, you don't have so much control. When right. you read and you build your own construct, you know, as I said, as, as I will have done and as I do every time I read a novel, well, you, you know, you picture yourself, you know, you, you, you have that, that little world. Phil was a, was a great instigator of thought i mean for me i mean this is my experience it's like um when i first got introduced to him which is around 1990 that arrange it's like when i when i inter introduced myself to his stories as i started adding them buying books and reading them and devouring them it's like the one of the value experiences of my of my personal experience reading Philip Jose Farmer was that so few of his books, if any, ended. They almost always concluded, but the world kept on going, which is how the real world is, right? We don't when our story ends, when we die, the world continues on and the lives around us continue on. And it was unusual in my reading experience to find an author who was willing to conclude a story without ending the story, with letting me, with, in other words, not wrapping everything up in a bow, mm -hmm. but, but ending maybe a plot point, but not, but this sense that everything continues on. And okay. if everything continues on, it continues on beyond Phil's life. The saga continues. The overall, right. which means well, when contributes, which that. means when continues, and Phil continues, and Chris continues, and all of these people contribute to this world. We are all gods in a sense of of continuing this this concept and these stories and telling these stories. And so, yes, this idea of the, of, of asking whether Tarzan is real or not. He's as real as each and one, each and every one of us wants him to be. To me, that's Absolutely. my perspective. Yeah, you know, it's like I am okay with saying, "Yeah, Tarzan's real." I'm okay with that. And um, he's real to Phil in that way, right? Yeah, and yeah. He, I mean, he played that game and that conceit that he was literally a real flesh and blood human being that he had met which is great, but I think you're absolutely right, Keith. To Phil, he was real in that other way that you're describing as well. And I just, I do want to mention, like kind of pick up on your, because you mentioned it twice, the idea that Phil left his stories open-ended. And it's something I've thought a lot about. So I don't know if this is straying too far from Tarzan, but, uh, you know, I he did that on purpose and he, he planted seeds. He was the he was the, he planted more seeds than any other writer I know. So that these yeah. little things that are just like in your mind, just and they blossom later, like way way mm -hmm. later. Like it might be years later. You're thinking about this weird little thing that he said, <laughs> or you're rereading the book, you know, and and then you're like, oh, now I get it, you yeah. know, like, and it leads to this whole other thing, you yeah. know. And he whether it was Easter eggs that he's putting in little little secrets, uh, breadcrumbs that he's putting in there. Uh, or what. Um, and so that leaving it open-ended also did that because the story was never over and it, it could continue right. along. You know? Yeah. I mean that when I wrote my first fan letter to him in the mid nineties, that was what it, that was one of the things I, I mentioned to him was, was this idea that every, that none of these stories end. I feel like, and, 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 uh, and maybe, maybe that's why they resonate with me beyond any other author in terms of where I want to see what happens next. There's so many authors that when they're done, it's like, I have no interest in what other authors bring to the table. But on farmer's worlds. And, 
And I'm so, always interested in hearing what people extrapolate from that. I don't care what Brian Herbert brings to Frank Herbert's world. I don't care about that. But I care a lot about what Chris Carey or Will Eckert or uh, what others bring to the table here, Frank Shulden or others bring to the table here in, a, in continuing uh, Phil's worlds. And, I, don't, I don't have that with other authors. It's just this one. And, and I think that... Uh, isn't it interesting that, you know, one of Phil's major themes with, in, in interests just personally was immortality. Yeah. And I think this was one of his solutions to immortality because he knew if he left them open-ended, he knew if he left the seeds there, that it would, that he would have something that would go on past him, right. you know, it would continue on. People would keep so, on thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, People, you know, it's like, I remember watching Wynn talking to Phil about the Wold Newton thing. And Phil was so intrigued by what Wynn was bringing to the table here. Right. I mean, he was it, it was beyond what he himself was thinking and he fully embraced it. Yeah. Right. Yep. He encouraged it and he encouraged us. Yep. And, you know, even though he was late in life when I was privileged to be around him, you know. Yeah, I but I saw those conversations. It's like, that's what I'm yeah. saying. It's like, I could see, I could see the twink, again, the twinkle in his eye, which yeah, you can't ever little. forget about knowing it, right? Uh, is that those eyes. And, and when you just saw it happen, you just knew when it happened, right? It's like, he was into it. He was into hearing what you were bringing to the table here and what Chris was bringing to the table here. Yeah. You know, it, he was so in, I mean, and so, yeah, it's like the man who met Tarzan is an opportunity, almost like we're, we're bringing Phil back into the ball game here a little bit, you know. Great. <laughs> all right all right i guess that's a good a uh, good wrap up point <laughs> I, mean, I feel like i hogged it there for a little bit but it's like uh, this the the man who met tarzan just looks like a great a great opportunity for people to uh uh meet phil and tarzan both on uh, at uh, on the same field playing field you know and if i can just point is that if you if we if if farmer fans are seeing this panel discussion and they're not necessarily Tarzan fans, mm -hmm. that's okay. Because if you're a farmer fan, you still want, you still want to get this book. Like you said, yeah. to, know, to know more about Phil or vice versa. If you're a Tarzan fan, you know, there's definite, there are definitely depths um, that you can gain from, from picking up this book. So Meteors. I don't know. I don't know how you could be a fan of Time's Last Gift and not be a fan of Tarzan. I mean, come on. To right. me, that's Tarzan. <laughs> you know. Okay. Anyway, Paul, what do you got to say there? Well, I was going to say, you know, back to one of your earlier questions. Do you know? Do I think Tarzan is sure. is real? And I do because I'm convinced by Phil's arguments. So you know, I just think, um, you know. Phil convinced me, you know, I came to Tarzan more from reading Farmer than any other way. I mean, I'd seen the Ron Ely television show. I'd seen some of the Wiseman movies, but I'd never read a Tarzan novel before I read Farmer. Um, yeah, so I came from Farmer into, into Tarzan. Um, and, I, you know, I'm convinced by the evidence he gathered. So if it's good enough for Phil, it's good enough for me. So, yes, I believe but Tarzan Amen. is a real character. That's great. And uh, you got any last words here, Chris? Um, as our as our resident Edgar Rice Burroughs person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I like just kind of echoing what we said at the beginning. Um, you know, I, I think Tarzan just imprinted on Phil uh, at an early age. And you can't really know Phil without knowing Tarzan, you know, and uh, um, I, if somebody reads Time's Last Gift and they have, haven't read Tarzan of the Apes and don't know the, don't know the story there, um, then they're probably, they're, they're probably getting it anyway, because Phil is still conveying that authentic Tarzan in it. You right. know what I mean? So, so they, they might not realize it. So when they get to reading Tarzan, they might feel uh, something very familiar 
mm -hmm. because you know Phil was channeling that. So hmm. yeah. Perfect. Well, okay. Then I think we can call this a wrap on the uh, the man who met Tarzan. Thank you, Wynn. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Thank you, Keith. This has been a fantastic discussion. And again, if uh, in, anybody who's watching this is also a part of FarmerCon, this is just a small sampling of <laughs> what you can experience in the larger FarmerCon experience in the evenings. Just come join us grab a scotch and sit down and relax and join the crowd because these kinds of discussions are exactly what you're going to find in farmer con it's why it's the best thing out there so, <laughs> cheers you bet. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Take care. all right thanks for joining yeah. us thank you